Hello, Embercon. Uh, we have not already met. I'm Godfrey. You can find me on the internet as Chenkin Code. And uh, as of a few weeks ago, I'm also now officially a YouTuber, so you can find me on ChenkinCode.tv there, where you can watch me build completely useless stuff on the computer. If that sounds interesting to you, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and um, for my internet followers, I just want to point out that I do take your feedback very seriously. Last year, I gave a very, very serious talk with Yehuda here, and uh, that was the feedback I got. So this year, I decided this software thing is not working out for me after all. Um, but then, Leia came to me, and she was like, hey, we need someone to like entertain the crowd after lunch, but we couldn't afford a comedian, so like, are you interested? And I was like, sure, why not? I'll, I'll take it. But I, and then I was thinking about, like, you know what would be like hilarious? Like, what if what if I write an abstract for a fake talk and put it on the schedule? Then no one would see this coming, right? So, so here we are. Uh, <laughs> you didn't really think there was going to be a talk after lunch, right? Uh, okay, I, I do have a talk. I mean, I should probably say I, I had a talk because um, this time I actually prepared for this like in advance and uh, I wrote everything down on paper and like actual you know, dead tree papers. And then I was thinking, oh, I, all I need to do is to make the slide uh, after the speaker dinner yesterday. But then when I got home, Tom messaged me and was like, uh, I got all your notes. So change of plans. <laughs> uh, anyway, if you have been around long enough, you probably know that this is what I do here. I am the Canadian on the team. I represent the country. I am a Canadian ambassador. And that was me. Uh, that was me representing Canada on national TV, like U.S. national TV, uh, a few years ago. Um, but since last year, I noticed something different. Like these days, when I meet someone new, like before I bring up anything, usually they, they like before I even bring up anything, they would tell me, "Oh, like actually, I want to move to Canada." So I was like, "Wow, I probably did such a good job in the last few years. I don't need to do, they don't really need me anymore." So I am very proud to say I have promoted myself to a world ambassador this year. And as part of my job, I have traveled to quite a few places in the last few years, and I, uh, in the last year, and I would love to tell you about them. And uh, because I'm a world ambassador, I would like to call it the Hello World Tour. But if you work for a VC-funded startup, you're probably more used to calling it an incredible journey, which is <laughs> the same thing. So here you go. <laughs> First stop, Taiwan. Uh, lots of great food. I really recommend spending time in their beautiful countryside. Um, the only weird thing is their government were on a trial version of Exchange Server, so their Outlook platform has very limited capacity, and you see these <laughs> pop-up dialogues everywhere. Uh, next up, Singapore. Um, Singapore is basically a tech hub in Asia these days. Uh, the government are really investing in technology. The latest tourist attraction is this thing called Singapore cloud forest where you can watch the AWS farmers grow your Heroku dinos on binary trees. So that was pretty interesting for me. Um, and next up, Spain. I don't know a lot about a country, so I Googled it before I went. But I feel like if the first Google search for your country is like your meal times, I don't really need to say too much to promote this country. And I also want to point out that this is actually not the, com the complete list, because if you uh, click that. <laughs> There are at least one or two more meals in the article. So that's Spain for you in a nutshell. And then Australia. There was something I want to point out here, but I kind of forgot what it is. So, uh, But I do remember that toilets flush the other way around. So that's that. And then South Korea. The most impressive thing for me was that they have free Pokeballs in the subway. <laughs> and um, I, I couldn't read Korean, but then like, they have pictures to show you how to throw the Pokeball if you're new to this. Uh, and then in Japan, uh, you probably know that Japanese people are very organized and they work very efficiently. Uh, the secret is that they have standardized everything. And you can go to these standard bookstores to, like, you know, their RFCs, ISOs, like, specs and stuff. I got a copy of ESX when I was there in Japanese, so I can really read it. But anyway, the last, the last, not the least, since I live here in Portland now, I figure I should give Portland a shout out as well. One of the best things about Portland is uh, we're able to support a lot of um, 
local businesses. So while you're here, it would be great if you can help us out by hashtag shop local. Um, for example, my favorite clothing store is a local boutique called Nike. Um, <laughs> if you're craving for authentic Mexican cuisine, there's a little shop called Tago Time. And um, if you're visiting from another country, you really can't miss this traditional American restaurant in the Northwest Industrial Area. And uh, yesterday I also learned they have the best coffee in town at 4 a.m. in the morning. And uh, finally, if you're looking to buy some artisanal handcrafted local software to take home with you, uh, you can't go wrong with this tiny shop uh, in downtown Portland. Uh, they're also hiring. Anyway, that's a wrap for our incredible journey. And uh, if you happen to run a conference in your country and you are looking for someone to promote your city, please do get in touch. And with all the serious stuff out of the way, we can finally get into the comedy section. Uh, what I really want to talk about today is a thing I invented, invented which I call the hierarchy of speed. Um, you might have heard of a similar concept in psychology or from today's keynote. Uh, this is where the psychologist and Tom Yehuda took the inspiration from. At the bottom of my hierarchy, you have laws of physics and then hardware, various level of kernel code, um, and then various level of user line code. And on top of that, you have um, human factors. So the reason this is a hierarchy is because everything kind of builds on top of the layer below, right? So, um, and each layer adds a little bit of overhead. So uh, every time you improve a layer, everything on top of it automatically benefits from it. So for example, if you make a network, uh, if you make the network faster, everything would just download quicker. And if you make the CPU faster, your app would automa automatically run faster as well without you having to do anything. Um, on the other hand, the bottom layer also set an upper limit of how fast you can make the, the layers on top of it, right? So for example, the speed of light is a constant, right? Like you can't change how physics work. So if you make a network round trip from here to Asia and back, then it's gonna, even in the ideal world, it's gonna cost you like at least 70 milliseconds. Probably a lot more than that in practice. Um, and it also turns out that we're getting pretty good at building these CPUs, right? So the amount of time it takes for a signal to travel from one corner to the other corner of the CPU actually turns out to um, be placing a bottleneck on a bottleneck or an upper bound on how fast we can make these CPUs. So uh, that being said, as a JavaScript as a JavaScript developer, it's quite unlikely that you have to um, go all the way to the bottom of this pyramid, and if your MRAP is slow, it's quite unlikely that you can get away with blaming physics. So <laughs> instead of looking at the whole thing, we'll focus on a small part of triangle, uh, which I call the hierarchy of JavaScript performance. So um, at the bottom, you have JavaScript engines like V8, right, on top of that. You have libraries and framework you use like Ember, and on top of that sits your application code. Unfortunately, I only have 30 minutes, and I already blew half of it on jokes, so I can't go very deep today. And so instead, this is gonna be a whirlwind tour where you get a like taste test of um, everything, but we can't go, like we can't get into a lot of depth for each topic. Um, so my job here is primarily to give you a mental framework to think about performance, and we will um, try to take that framework and apply it to each of the layers here. And finally, we'll pop back out and talk about uh, the big picture and how these things interact with each other. So let's start with the mental framework. So in my opinion, there are two ways to analyze this, right? The first way is to look at this from the perspective of your time budget. So let's say you have decided it's really important for your app to uh, render in like under a second, right? So, or a thousand milliseconds. <laughs> Right, so a question you can ask yourself is how many operations can you do at each of the layers before you blew half of your budget? So uh, it's, it's not very scientific, real thumb, and I, I, I do apologize for using metric here. Uh, the things you do in JavaScript engines tend to be measured in nanoseconds, so, and uh, the things you do in your library tends to be measured in microseconds, and the things you do, uh, the high-level operations you do in your application code tends to be measured in milliseconds. So if you do the math on that, um, then 
let's say you have an operation that takes 50 milliseconds in your application, right? then you only have to do it 10 times before you blew half of your budget. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a 50 microsecond operation in inside Ember, let's say, uh, you would have to do it 10,000 times. And uh, likewise, if you have a 50 nanosecond operation in the engine, uh, it would, like you would basically have to run it 10 million times to have the same effect. So to help you visualize it, let's say you have a pretty complicated component that takes 15 milliseconds to render. Maybe it's a newsfeed item that uses a few other components, do some string localization, formatting, and stuff like that. Uh, so if you put 10 of those on your screen, then um, that would be half of your one second budget right there. So uh, doing this have a very significant effect on your bottom line. On the other hand, let's say you measure the overhead of reading a computer property in Ember, it's say 15 microseconds, right? So in this case, uh, you would have to do that 10,000 times to have the same effect on your app. And finally, uh, let's say you are, you're worried about the cost of allocating an object in JavaScript, right? So you measure that, turns out to be 50 nanoseconds or so, which means you have to do it 10 million times to have the same effect, and to uh, put that into perspective, this is what it looks like. Right? So I literally ran out of pixels on the other screens up to scale everything. It's roughly five times the pixels that was on the previous slide. So that's how it compares to everything. So now there are some caveats here. Right? For example, rendering component, the first time is always much more expensive because you have to load the code, you have to parse the code, you have to warm the catches and stuff like that. So you, can't really just multiply the numbers like that, but nevertheless, it's still a pretty good rule of thumb. And the, the moral of the story is, it's always the case that you can make the most impact um, at the upper layers of the pyramid. So that's the time budget based analysis. The other way to look at it is uh, look at a micro versus macro split. Um, in my opinion, my, macro means do fewer things overall, and micro means do the same thing faster. So let's say you have a loop that looks like this. The micro approach would be to ask, wow, holy crap, why is, it, why is the sleep taking a millisecond? That seems like a really long time. Uh, the macro approach is like, wait a minute, why are we sleeping 10,000 times? Or like, why are we sleeping in our app at all? Now, in the real world, this is not going to be so straightforward, right? Like, we'll, we'll look at some examples later. Um, but this is, this is the rough idea of what I'm getting at. And uh, the other way to understand micro versus macro split is to uh, base it on your persona, right? So sometimes you're an application developer. Sometimes you are working on your open source libraries, right? So you're putting on different hats or working on different layers in those cases. Um, so the way I... A we'll look at it is um, macro basically means improving your algorithmic uh, properties in the current layer that you're working at. Basically, how can I uh, do fewer things overall in my app versus micro would be how can I be smarter in the ways that I use the layer below. So that's, 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 a, that's the framework part. So now we can try applying this to the layers we have on the left. So let's start with the application layer. If you recall, uh, we said that things are generally measured in milliseconds here. The, uh, the hypothetical example we have was um, that a component takes 50 milliseconds to render. Um, however, the lowest hanging fruit usually is things like a network request, which is usually uh, a very easy way to blow tens or hundreds of milliseconds in your budget. So if you, uh, if you can find ways to eliminate that do it. If you can use shoebox, do that. If you can use service worker, great, do that. Right. But so those problems are the lowest hanging fruit, but then those are also pretty well understood. So today I want to focus on a, a lesser known part of that problem, which I call hidden loops. So in particular, I would like to call two specific cases of this problem, uh, the big data problem and the backtracking problem. So. Uh, Let's see. So what I mean by big data is that when you are developing a feature, you are probably working with a limited set of uh, mock data in your local machine or like a 
mock account on the staging server. So everything is pretty fast and snappy. However, as soon as you deploy that to production, you might be surprised that some of your customers actually have a lot more data than you expect, right? So now suddenly your app cannot queue up. Or perhaps you're building a new product, right? So at the beginning, you don't really have any data in there. Uh, so things, of course, are very fast. But over time, your customers added a lot of data to your database, and your app, over time, uh, lost the ability to keep up with that. So that's the big data problem. And having a lot of data is intrinsically bad because you need to like download those data and parse them, right? So that's one of the problems. But even if those times look as acceptable to you, there's still in there a pretty dangerous aspect of that is, uh, which is the way they compound. So this is the time that you, you wish you pay attention to your uh, math class. So let's say you're rendering a 100 model, which is perhaps a little bit too much, but this doesn't sound catastrophic yet. But however, imagine to render each of those model, you need to render a computed property which compares that single model to every other model, right? So then uh, suddenly, without noticing it, we are back to the 10,000 magic number, which if you recall is the number of times you have to call like a, a 50 microsecond operation to have the same effect as your like many components, right? So, um, so that's one of the way that this could creep up on you. And the other favor of the problem, which I will do briefly, is uh, the backtracking problem, which is invalidating already flushed content. So let's say you have a, uh, you have a form, right? So you have a date that you're rendering, and then you render a date picker to change that date. So um, however, in the, the receive adders hook on the date picker component, you have some validation logic, right? So, oh, this is February 30th, and that date doesn't exist, so I need to do something about it, and you set it back to the default. However, you will notice that on the left, in the parent component, we have already rendered the date Field. And now you're setting, like, this, this is a little bit uh, tricky because uh, this is bubbling up via um, two-way bindings. Um, but there are also other ways for this to manifest, right? So the, the general theme is you already render something on a screen, and then now you're setting it again in the same uh, render cycle. So the only thing we could do at that point is to, after, like, is to complete the current render loop and then reschedule the entire render top to bottom again. Uh, which basically doubles your work. So that's the backtracking problem uh, in my opinion. These are, these are the prime kind of problems that like, the, the framework should catch for you. So um, since 2.10, this is, this is now an error, and we uh, got much better at catching these cases, and we have um, much better error message for these thanks to Gavin from Intercom. So that's that. So, uh, let's recap. So, uh, on, like, I think micro, sorry, macro is, in general, the approach to handle that is pretty, uh, pretty much the same everywhere. Um, if you can avoid doing the work in the first place, then don't do it. If you can reuse the work by uh, either hoisting up the common operations or by adding catches, do that, right? Like. Uh, another way to deal with it is if you don't immediately need the work because it's below the fold or you don't need it until the user try to interact with it, then try to defer it until you actually need it. Um, then if you run out of macro things to do, um, then the micro things you can do here is uh, basically, as I said, this is about how we can use the layer below smarter, right? So in this case, how can we help uh, Ember out to uh, be more performant. So generally, you shouldn't do these things, but in hot paths and you have no other ways to do it, uh, you can, if, if it turns out the problem is that rendering a component is too expensive for some reason, uh, then one of the workaround is you can use a helper that returns a DOM node instead of um, using a component. Again, usually this is not necessary. But um, if it comes down to it, it, like if you have a very hot loop, then this is something you can consider. Uh, likewise, there's the unbound helper, which is basically hinting at Glimmer to be smarter about how it handled the, the content there. And uh, 
the third one is not really available yet, but I have an RFC that allows you to uh, create custom components that are more tailored to your use case, which might be helpful in cases where um, performance is super critical. Um, so before we wrap up this layer, let's talk about some of the tools that you have at your disposal to look at the problems at this layer. So the first one is the network tab in Chrome. The second one is time, or actually the network tab is basically in every browser. The timeline is more specific to Chrome. And the third one is the HTML5 user timing API, which is, as far as I know, implemented in most browsers. So um, this is just very quickly, this is the network tab in the Chrome Inspector, basically show you the network request you're making, which is, again, the lowest hanging fruit usually. Um, and then this is the timeline view, which is a little bit more complicated, uh, so it takes some time to understand it. But it basically tells you uh, how many frames are you rendering per second, how much CPU you're using, um, you can do JavaScript profile, and things like that. And finally, the user timing API is basically you can do window.performance.mark and things like that to insert custom uh, points that you're interested in at, and you can you know, like calculate the time you spend in particular things. Um, the nice thing about this is actually, uh, if you use the user timing API, it would actually show the marker in the Chrome timeline view, which is pretty nice and pretty helpful. So, um, like I said, we don't have a lot of time to get into details, uh, but if you have specific questions, we can talk about it after the talk. So, the second layer is the libraries layer. So, the hypothetical example I gave, and this is uh, not a real number, but let's say we are, we're worried about the kind of operations like ember.get or ember.meta or ember.set, right? Those kind of um, low-level operations in Ember. So the thing about libraries is they're written in JavaScript, right? So it's not that different from your code. The main difference is um, these things tend to be called a lot more times than your code, right? So your component, if you're rendering 10 of them, 100 of them, that's many. But uh, it would not be surprising at all if ember.get is called tens or hundreds of thousands of times in, like in a single render. And also, these code tend to be uh, quite generic in the, in the sense that they are doing a very general purpose thing. So sometimes it's very difficult to think about ways that you can um, optimize it because the API is so generic. So again, the macro strategy at this layer is basically the same thing. Don't do the work, reuse the work, or defer the work. And um, I have some recent examples that I cannot, again, go into a lot of details, but um, one of the things that came to mind is recently, um, or up until recently, the instantiating the first instance of a class in Ember is somewhat expensive because we have to um, extend your class two times for to, uh, to add the factory injections. Uh, so that's known as the double extend problem. Um, this turn, turns out the only reason we have to do that is to support a private API called underscore lookout factory. So what we did is, um, uh, we, we basically deprecated that private API and exposed a new public API called Factory4 um, that doesn't have the same problem. So uh, that happened recently, and I think as of the current beta, we have the new, um, the new API. Well, the new API landed in the last, uh, in 2.12, basically. Um, and because we landed that in 2.12, and 2.13 and above, we were able to eliminate the cost of the double extent, which is pretty nice. Um, another one by Robert is to uh, basically make some of the lesser uh, used features pay as you go. And um, finally, on the Ember data, the Ember data team have been doing a lot of work on these kind of issues. Uh, and um, as you can see, there are a lot of PRs that was recently merged in some part of Ember data in, uh, in the last release or so got basically like roughly twice as fast. So micro-optimization at this layer requires understanding the engine, which is what we're getting to next, so I will skip that for now. Um, the tools for this layer is basically 
uh, CPU profiler or sampling profiler, flame graphs, and uh, a library that the Ember Data team was using to find all of those issues called Hamdel. So this is the CPU profiler in Chrome, which is basically the same thing as the JS profile in the timeline view, but it gives you more a more focused view to work with. And then this is the same data, but presented using a flame graph. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think I can explain that now, but we can talk about it more if, you, if you're curious later. And then finally, this is um, one of the, the formatter for Amazon, which is, uh, which it basically, uh, it's similar to user timing API in the sense that it let you mark different phases in your code. Um, but it, it just has a better API for tracking, uh, especially nested things and also grouping them nicely. Um, you can look at this pull request from Ember Data for more details. So uh, let's get to the final layer. So JavaScript engines. So, uh, so here is a quick origin story for modern JavaScript engines or how they made JavaScript fast. So uh, very briefly, let's look at how C works. I apologize for doing that, but it will, it will be quick. So um, let's say you have a function in C that takes a point and try to calculate the, uh, I guess, a point vector and try to calculate the length of the, the vector, which is square root x square plus y square, I think. Um, so uh, the thing about C is the compiler can see, oh, like this function is taking a thing called a point, and then you can, uh, you're doing p dot x and p dot y here, uh, but no problem because you know point is a struct and it has two fields. Therefore, you know if point is located here, then p dot x would be located um, in the first slot and p dot y would be located in the second slot, and that's how you get access to the, um, the, the parts of the point. Seems good. Um, however, on JavaScript, uh, everything is a dictionary, or at least that's the full grain model, right? So um, here you can see that there's no type annotation. So when like you need to execute this function, you like you don't know what a p is, right? It could be a string, it could be a number, who knows? And so uh, when you need to access p dot x, basically the runtime is like not sure, like. Do you have a thing called x? Can you find it for me? I'll go get it. Right? So, so basically, as you can imagine, implementing everything as a dictionary would be very slow. Uh, so at some point, the V8 team, or like a, I believe this is actually an optimization that was borrowed from Smalltalk or something. Um, but basically, as you are creating the instance, you can actually um, track what properties are in those instances and basically create a hidden class for these things, or also known as shapes or maps, right? They're basically talking about the same thing. So what you can do is when you call this function, you can basically look at, oh, P, what is the map or what is a hidden class for this type? And oh, okay, it's basically a struct with two fields, seems good. And what you can do now is you can say, oh, if this thing is a P, then you can hard, basically uh, hard code. I, I would just offset it at the, the zero position or the, the first position. Uh, what this enables is uh, just in time optimizations, or as they call it in friends, legit. Uh, what you can do now is you can compile and optimize. This is not a real notation, but like it would do for our purpose. You can compile a special optimized version of get length, hard codes uh, p to be uh, the points type, basically. And so um, everything else that follows it, just follow that assumption. And um, you, what, you can also do more inlining. So basically you can, um, instead of actually calling math.pow or math.square root, you can just copy the implementation, move it into here. The nice thing is because you already know at this point that p is a point, then you can also eliminate a lot of the extra checks in math.pow pow or mf dot square root that it's basically um, checking the same conditions. So the tools here are native syntax, or native syntax, Chrome tracing, our Hydra 2. Uh, so the easiest way to play with native syntax uh, for 
to explore these kind of things is to use Node probably. So you can launch Node with dash dash allow native syntax, native syntax, and um, you can see that if you create different objects with different shape, you can use the percentage syntax to uh, check what type they, the engine thinks they are. And this is the Chrome tracing, which is a thing you can do at Chrome, like you can go to Chrome colon slash slash tracing, which actually show you all the low level um, operations that the browser is doing. And finally, IO Hydra 2 is a little bit of uh, dark magic, but uh, it's basically a tool that allow you to look at the compilation uh, that V8 is doing, and then it would also show you some information about DOPS, which unfortunately we don't have time to get to today. Um, maybe it will show up in a blog post in the future. Um, however, I would like to jump back to the big picture point very quickly. Um, so uh, unfortunately we don't have time to go through the DOPS stuff. Basically, um, when you combine all the layers together, they could interact in ways that you do not expect. So um, at the end of the day, uh, even if you're very confident, you still have to rely on very macro end-to-end -end benchmarks to know that you, uh, to feel confident that you um, actually achieve the positive change. So uh, our, the Ember team basically wrote a tool called Emberbench, which allowed us to um, script building custom builds of Ember and custom build of an app and um, uses a tool that Chris wrote called Chrome Tracing. Uh, that basically launches Chrome uh, many, many times for you and like go, like visit this URL and then record how long it took for the initial render, do it like maybe a thousand times and then give you error bounds and stuff. So that was how we were able to um, make a lot of these micro optimizations and when we're working on Glimmer and things like that, even though they are like in isolation, very difficult to measure with confidence. So finally, one last thing is um, one of another big picture problem is the 1,000 paper cuts problem. Right? Like a lot of times, um, not no one single person is doing a lot of things, but then um, because you're using different libraries or um, different teams are responsible for different parts of of your UI, you end up doing a lot of repeated work for not a lot of good reason, and no single party is responsible for it. Um, and I, I think this is where uh, a framework like Ember really shine because we have a lot of opportunity to notice that, notice these duplicated work and we can um, do some macro optimization that, uh, that are not otherwise possible by coordinating better, by eliminating some of these uh, repeated work. Um, I, I think we, we're probably not doing as much as we could, but I think we are in a, well, we're within plenty of those, but I also think we're in a good position to do more of that in the future. Um, so anyway, that is my very quick tour of JavaScript performance for you, and um, thank you very much.